books. We're finishing up a message series today. It's been a short series, been a bit of an unusual series for us. Uh, if you would like to take some notes today, sometimes you do those gray sermon notebooks on the side tables. You can grab one of those. Uh, but over the last three weeks, like I said, been something of an oddity. It's almost like we've been talking to ourselves and, and, and having a conversation with ourselves about who are we. Uh, it's kind of like you know, writing a letter to ourselves, dear us, right? This is where we come from, uh, and this is what makes us unique and different from, from other churches. And so we'll return to kind of our, our regularly scheduled programming of moving through the book of Matthew next week when we get back to our On Mission series. And we begin to talk about some different aspects of Jesus' mission and our mission. Uh, but today's important because we're going to drill down just one more level, right? If you were here two weeks ago, Aaron kind of kicked this one off uh, with really a look at where do Baptist churches kind of come from. Uh, and he, he, he helped us follow just the flow of Christianity from the time of the apostles, right, through the building up of, of what was known as the Catholic Church at that point, and then the split between the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, and then he kept following us on down until we got to Baptist. And then last week, we took it and kind of went down another level. What is it that's unique, not all the things, but some of the things about a particular Baptist church? Like, what do Baptists believe that are different from Episcopalians or Presbyterians or Catholics or something like that? Today, we go even one step further down, and we talk about this particular church. We're going to talk about what's the mission of the church, that's kind of the first step today, of any church, but of this church in particular, and then how were we organized to fulfill that mission, and all of this is so that you guys, we're, we're actually, if, if you're not familiar, our church is going through a reorganization process right now. Uh, it started back in the fall, it's kind of continuing, but a lot of this is in a way to kind of communicate some of this out to you guys, but how were we organized to fulfill the mission of God, and then that kind of leads logically into, you know, how might you plug into that? So I'm going to pray for us, and, and we're going to jump in. Almighty and eternal God, uh, your word, Lord, is a lamp unto our feet, it is a light unto our path. Uh, open our minds today, God, illuminate them with your word that we may purely and perfectly understand your word and that our lives may change and be conformed to what we have understood. That in all things, that in every aspect of our lives, we might be pleasing to you. And we pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So let's start with, with the question of, What's the purpose of the church, right? For what reason? And, and we have been discussing this somewhat in our on-mission kind of category, but we'll, we'll take a broader kind of bigger picture look at it today. What is the reason and purpose for the church? And there's maybe a dozen things or more that, that we could talk about today. I'm going to try to summarize them into three different things. But number one, if you're going to write them down, you can take notes in your, in your sermon notebook, your phone, however you want to do it, or you can just remember them. The number one, worship. What is the purpose of the church? The church is here to worship. And what do we mean by that? Because we've been taught, you've been taught in the contemporary American church that worship is what? Singing. And that's it, right? We have worship leaders. And what does the worship leader do? Music and singing, right? That's not necessarily wrong, but it's a very kind of narrow look at it. But let's try to broaden our perspective here a little bit today. At its heart, worship is an acknowledgement, an acknowledgement of who God is and the greatness of the Lord, right? That God is the only God, that he is completely unique, right? The kids sang about it, three plus three or one plus one plus one equals what? One, right? That our God is, is very, three people, one God, like it, it God is completely unique and different. He's worthy of our worship and praise, that he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Right? The worship is our response then to that reality. So we can really think of it in kind of two senses. There's a very narrow view of worship, and it's not, it's not a wrong view of worship, but the narrow view of worship is like weekly worship. It's what we do when we come together on Sunday morning. 
We gather together as God's people. We, we, we come into this room, right? And then we, we sing, we pray, we read scripture, we confess faith, we confess sin, we preach the word, we hear the word, right? There's communion, we baptize, like all of these things in the narrow sense is what God has called the church to do. It's what we gather to do on Sundays, and they are essential functions. And now we worship on Sunday, right? No longer it is it the Sabbath, the, the seventh day of the week where we celebrate, the Jewish people celebrated the end of God's work. Now we worship on Sunday, the first day of the week, the day of the resurrection, the new life, the new creation, right? As we look to what Jesus has done in our lives and what he's going to do in the future. And it's an acknowledgement of what God has done. Everything we do in here on Sunday, whether it's listening to scripture being read or singing, or preaching, or hearing the word spoken, is worship. But that's a very narrow sense. And if, if we only look at worship in kind of that way, then what do we do with the other 24 hours in the rest of the days and 22 and a half hours today? Are we not to worship? We look at it in a broader sense. Worship is the everyday work of living all of life in an acknowledgement of God's greatness. Okay, you look at it in the narrow sense, it's what we do today. You look at it in the broad sense, it's what you do when you pull out of the parking lot and what you do on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, and the times that you're not here, right? It's life lived in the presence of God. Listen to Romans, uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I think summarize it really, really well. Paul writes to the church at Rome, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice." holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what's good and acceptable and perfect. This is the broad sense of worship, right? It's the everyday living in lives that are holy and righteous, and as a, we are living sacrifices to God, not being conformed to the world and what the world thinks and what the world believes and how the world wants you to act and believe and look, but being conformed to God's word and transformed by the blood of Christ so that we live in such a way as to bring glory to God. This is worship. This is the mission of the church. It's your mission every day of your life, morning, afternoon, evening, whether you're on a submarine or a, a Coast Guard cutter or you're in a classroom or an office or wherever you are. It's life lived in the constant acknowledgement of who God is and what God has done and how that changes everything you think and do. Throughout relationships, throughout jobs, marriages, all of it. It's living differently. Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, we won't, we won't read it. He says, like, listen guys, he says, don't walk like you used to walk. If, if you've been called into Christ, it's like a taking off of the old person and putting on a new person. That new person lives every moment of life in the awesomeness and amazingness of God's grace and mercy. That's the first thing, worship. The church is called. We are called to worship. We are called to worship on Sundays. We're called to worship every day. Second thing, we're called to nurture Christians. To nurture, the nurture of Christians. It is the purpose and mission of the church to bring Christians to full spiritual maturity. Salvation, that one of the, the greatest metaphors of salvation in the Bible is that when you are saved, when you follow Jesus, right, when you become a Christian, it's like you're born again. It's this conversation that Jesus had with Nehemiah in the Gospel of John, right? If you're, if you're not familiar with it, Nehemiah was a, one of the greatest teachers in Israel in Jesus' time. And he comes to Jesus and he, he starts asking questions and Jesus says, well, listen, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. And Nehemiah's like, look, man. I'm old. I can't climb back in there and be born again. And Jesus is like, no, dude, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, it's like you have to be born of the Spirit. You have to be reborn. And so there's a sense in which when someone becomes a Christian, like whether they're, you know, 10 or, or, or 20 or 50, that you become overnight a spiritual infant. 
You're born again, right? You may know how to, how to drive a nuclear submarine, or you may know how to do the most complex accounting, you know, out there in the business world, or you may know how to, how to build a house and frame it and do everything all the way up. You may, you may know all this, but in Christ, you're an infant. And it is the responsibility of the church then to take these spiritual infants and help them grow and help them learn so that they become spiritual children. And then they become spiritual youths. And then become spiritual adults. It's the responsibility of the church. Listen, Colossians 1.28. Write this one down if, if you've never really looked at it. It's kind of buried there in Colossians. But Paul says it. He says, him we proclaim, him being Christ. Paul says, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Paul's writing to a church. The book of Colossians is a, is a book, is a letter written to a church at a Roman town called Colossa. And Paul's saying, the purpose that you are there for is to proclaim him, Christ, warning people, teaching people with all wisdom that they might grow up and they might mature. In, in Paul's eyes, I mean, he says it in multiple places. Other places he's saying, look, guys, I fed you with milk. You should be eating solid food now, right? It's a, it's a metaphor, right? Paul's idea is that you were born a Christian, you were born an infant, but you don't stay there. You grow. And the church is the place that helps nurture that. The church is the place where, like, Jesus even echoes this in Matthew 5, 48. Jesus says, therefore, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Like, that's the goal. Like, the maturing process is the process of moving towards perfection. Now, here's the reality. You will never, ever, ever get there, and neither will I. And that's okay. Jesus knows that. And Jesus says, you know, look. I get that. There's grace for when we fail, right? And it happens all the time. Being a Christian doesn't mean that, that you reach perfection, but that you're striving towards it. And when you don't get there, you look at Jesus and you say, look, I'm sorry, I messed up. Help me, help me fix this. Help me grow. Right? You look at the church. You look at those around you and you say, help me grow in this area. And Jesus gives more grace and he picks you up and he puts you back on your feet and he says, try again. And that can happen over and over and over and over. Right? That, that grace never runs out. But it's one of the primary responsibilities of this church and every church out there for the Christians that are under its care. How do we help shepherd you through that process of being born again all the way to the point where you are a mature, functioning, adult Christian? That's the purpose of it. That's why, that's why I'm up here on Sundays preaching and teaching. That's why we open up God's word and we begin to walk through it. We, it at our church, we do it systematically, right? The, the ideal way is, is, is we take a book of the Bible, we work our way through it. We've done it in through dozens of books so far. We're going through Matthew now. At breaks in there, we'll pause and do other stuff like this. But how do you grow, right? It's, it's, it's not that... Uh, I mean, think about like how do, how do kids grow in, in, in their nourishment, right? You can't eat the same thing over and over and over again, right? You need a balanced diet of what you're going to eat, and God provides that in his word. It is our responsibility to give that to you. We do it through teaching in children's church, through juniors, through youth, through small groups, through Wednesday night Bible studies. We do it with counseling. If you're in financial distress or marital challenges or emotional times, we do it through pastoral care and deacon care, right? There's all these ways that it's the mission of the church that's designed to help bring you from spiritual infancy up to maturity and helping sustain you. That's the mission of the church. We're to worship. And we're to help Christians grow. And here's the third one. We are to witness to the world. That's the third one. We are to witness to the world. It's the church's purpose to communicate a message to the world by our lives, by our interactions with others, and by what we say and what we do, and what we don't say and what we don't do. It's our responsibility to show the world who Jesus is and who God is. John, uh, the Apostle John writes in, in his gospel, John chapter 13, 34 through 35, he's recording Jesus' words. But Jesus says this, he says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I've loved you, 
You are to love one another, and by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. Like we witness to the world, church, by how we treat one another. Do we love one another? The Old Testament, right? The, God commanded his, his people, right? They were to, to give the poor no interest loans. They were to help them get back on their feet. They were to take the edges of their fields and leave them, right? They were to have open harvest years on sabbatical years. In the New Testament, you see churches, right, selling property. You see that in Acts chapter 2, right? People just began selling their property to support their brothers and sisters. You see collections of money from one church to another. You see healings and miracles, right? We witness to the world by who we are and the mercy that we show to one another and to outsiders. We witness to the world by evangelism. Jesus' last commandment was go make disciples. Like There's a message that we take from this place out there. It's the most important message in the world. And it's a message of how do you get reconciled to God? Because you need that. Like, this is what the church does. We worship, we help Christians mature, and we witness to the world. Like, that's the broad kind of perspective of it. So if, if you look at that, then you go, okay, well, in the church, kind of who's responsible for this, right? Like, how does this happen? So I want to just very, very briefly, because over the past, uh, actually, I think it was about almost exactly a year ago, we did a series on elders and deacons, um, so I'll refer you back. If you go into the app, you go into the website, there's a two week, two-week little study we did on elders and deacons. But uh, I want to give you the offices in the church. There's actually four of them, okay? There's four of them. Here's the first one. You ready? King Jesus. You can't have his job. Uh, King Jesus. Christ is the head of the church. Listen to Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. There is only one head of the church, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Full stop. It's not a, not a guy somewhere, it's not a girl somewhere, there is only one head of the church, and that is King Jesus. The second office, like I said, I'm going to hit these quickly, apostles, right? Twelve men chosen by Jesus, traveled with him, ministered with him, Peter, Andrew, John, James, all those guys, Matthew, right? They traveled with Jesus, they were taught by Jesus, they were chosen by Jesus, they were appointed by Jesus. It was them and their close associates that wrote the entire New Testament. They wrote Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Acts and Romans, all of those things recorded by those guys over the course of their ministries. They took the message of Jesus and they started in Jerusalem and they went out to Judea. Judea and Samaria, and they scattered. They took the message throughout the Roman Empire. They took it outside the Roman Empire, all over the world. And when they passed, that office closed. There are no more apostles. There were only 12, and they're gone. So who's left? They told the churches, you put in place two people. You put in place elders, and you put in place deacons. Elders, men chosen by the church and by the other elders to care for spiritual needs, right? There's, there's, uh, there's several words in the New Testament that kind of summarize this. Episcopos, you'll see translated as overseer or bishop. That speaks to the leadership given by the elders. Poiemen is translated pastor or shepherd. That refers to their feeding and nurturing and protecting of God's people. And the other word, presbyteros, you'll see translated usually elder, speaks to the spiritual maturity needed. Their qualifications, you can write these down, is listed out in 1 Timothy 3. They're primarily character-related. They must be above reproach. They must be sober-minded. They must be self-controlled. There's a few skills mentioned. Uh, they need to manage their households well so they can manage the church well. They need to be able to teach 
And then there's some warnings. Mature Christians only, right? This is not a role or an office for those that have just been reborn, lest pride become an issue and they fall into a trap. Elders and pastors have the responsibilities for providing and overseeing preaching and teaching, for prayer, for oversight and pastoral care, for vision and leadership, and for church discipline when that has to happen. Okay, so that's the one first office that's left. The other is deacon. Men and women chosen by the churches to care for not necessarily the spiritual needs, but the earthly needs. They address the the temporal needs of the congregation. Qualifications are also laid out in 1 Timothy 3, mostly character-related. Dignified, not double-tongued, faithful in all things, spiritual, must hold the mystery of the gospel. They don't have to be able to teach because that's not in their primary role, though that's okay if they can. They serve. They serve the church in a variety of ways. Different churches use them in different ways. I'll talk about ours here a little bit more in just a minute. But that's the overview, right? There's King Jesus. There was the apostles. Jesus is in heaven. The apostles are with him. Now there are elders and deacons. So how then does this church kind of structure? Here's where we're leading towards today, okay? And if on your way out, you make your way by the side tables, you'll see like some organizational charts over there uh, and some contact lists. Uh, You can grab one of those. That'll be helpful. We are, like I mentioned earlier, we are going through a reorganization. One of the things that I kind of figured out last summer Late in the summer, as I sat down at my desk and I was feeling a little overwhelmed, uh, and I, I, I wrote out uh, our organization chart. And what I found was that there was me, and there was about 20-something people that all reported to me. And I was like, this isn't going to work. Uh, and so at that point, uh, we began to kind of go through a process. Uh, we selected several new elders. There are four elders in our church right now. Uh, there's myself, there's Mr. James Anderson, there's Aaron Cassavant, and there's Lou Binks. And James and I were the only two serving for a long time. Uh, and finally, we reached a point this past year where we were ready to call new elders. Uh, and we called Aaron and Lou. Uh, I'm the only one that is full-time, right? So I serve on the church staff. I work here during the week. Even if you may wonder, what does he do during the week? I assure you, I'm pretty busy. Uh, so functionally, everyone else kind of reports up to me. But as a group, the elders are responsible for the spiritual needs of the church, right? We are the ones uh, that do most of all the preaching. So I'm up here this week. I'll be up here next week. uh, And then Lou will be up here for me the following week. Aaron just preached a few weeks ago. James will be coming up again soon, right? So uh, we are responsible for preaching and then to look out over all the teaching, whether it's what's being done in children's church or what's being taught in Bible studies and making sure that what you're being given Uh, meets the standard of of what Scripture teaches, right? That's our responsibility. We're responsible for prayer. Uh, We pray for the church. We pray for you. Every other Sunday, we meet in the back room back there. We did it this Sunday morning. We spent a time kind of talking through what's going on in our congregation, and there are a number of you here and some of you that are not here that we prayed for in person today. Uh, And we do that in our daily lives uh, and here before church every other week. We're responsible for pastoral care. We don't always do all the pastoral care because there's a lot of you guys and just a handful of us. The deacons help us with that. That's ministry to the sick. We visit those that are uh, in the hospital or at home, those that are hurting. It's a responsibility to go do that, right, to be with those people. It's our responsibility for leadership and vision, like where are we going? What should we be doing? What ministries should we start? What should we stop? Who leads them? And then, like I said, if we get to the end and, and there's a need for church discipline, that there's sin in the life of the church that needs to be addressed, that's our responsibility. We have elders. We also have deacons. Our deacons, we have six men and women that serve in that role. Uh, Mr. Tony Burns is currently serving as the deacon chair. Uh, Dick Maynard, Diane Tibbetts, Mark Tibbetts, Mike Utes, and Marie Utes also serve as deacons currently. They are appointed for a period of three years, so that group changes from time to time. Deacons are responsible for maintaining and organizing our worship space. You'll see them back when you come in. They greet you as they come in the door. They get everything set up. They'll take you where you need to go or meet the people you need to meet. They help us with family care. That You should see them as they circulate through the congregation and try to meet you guys so that they know who you are. Uh, They're available for prayer and for help. Uh, They generally help with our benevolence, which means if there's uh, those in our congregation in need or that need help, 
Uh, they are in, involved in that process. Uh, they prepare and serve communion, and there's a variety of other tasks. We're still trying to figure all this out as we make this change and what exactly fits into their roles, but you should see them quite a bit. Now, that's good, but that still leaves a lot of different areas. It's like, okay, well, who's responsible for this stuff? And so we have what we call ministry leaders. That's not a position defined in Scripture, uh, but it's one needed just to give some organization to the church. The ministry leaders report up to me personally and to the elders as kind of a, a bigger group. Uh, we have heads of those ministries. So, for example, outreach, Miss Marie Utes controls that for us, runs that for us. That includes, like, the Ledger Clothing Exchange, like our digital outreach, community outreach, right? And Ezra runs the music group that includes music and audiovisual. There's others, like children, sports. We do volleyball, basketball, missions, safety. There's administrative functions. Uh, Brittany takes care of the admin. Claire takes care of the treasury. Uh, David does facilities. So, you know, again, these are not defined by Scripture, but roles that, that we as a congregation have put in place to give organization to our ministries. And you'll find these people uh, on the side table. There's a list of them. So if you know of someone and you need to contact someone, you can find them on the website, on the Contact Us page, and in the church app. Uh, and so you say, okay, well, this is all good. Why are, why are you taking like a Sunday to do this? And it's so that our church can function the way it's supposed to function. Like, this should be helpful for you and for a couple of reasons. Like, I often get questions, you know, who do I talk to about blank? And this is to help you fill in the blank. If that's something children related, then you can go talk to Sherry. If that's something clothing exchange related, then you can go talk to Marsha. Or I get asked the question, who's in charge of blank? It doubly helpful because it enables you then to kind of start at that point of contact. If I have a question about the nursery or a question about AHG or a question about something like that, then you can go to that person to begin with, and then it can kind of work its way up the chain to the point that it needs to go up to. It also helps you understand, and here's kind of the, the point where I'm getting at today, uh, where you might plug in. Like If you look around... Uh, I've been at Gallup Hill Baptist Church now for a little over 10 years. Uh, and this church, you know, it began with about 20 adults uh, at that point and about half a dozen kids in the building up there. Uh, and it grew, right? And then we moved downstairs and it kept growing. And it, it, the growth kind of comes in spurts. Like it'll level off for a, a little while and then all of a sudden, bloop, we'll just jump up again. Uh, I don't know if you've looked around. We're in the middle of another little growth spurt, uh, and that's a good thing. And, and we are glad that, that you are here, uh, and we are overjoyed that, that you are part uh, of our church. Uh, but, it, you know, it, it enables us to begin to do some different things. And this is really our first growth spurt since COVID because COVID kind of made a mess out of everything. Uh, but it also enables you to kind of look out and say, okay, What's going on in this church, and where might I use the gifts that God has given me to plug in to help either in worship or in the nurturing of other Christians or in the witness, right, to the outside? So some things that are kind of on the, on, on the docket for today, right, our sports ministry. Uh, we have a thriving upward basketball program. Uh, and a middle school girls volleyball program. They have great leaders that are uh, directors that are currently running them. Uh, but what we don't have is that sports ministry leader that is called and, and loves that type of ministry and looks and wants to shape those ministries into greater ways to build the kingdom. There's new opportunities. I get people that ask me all the time, can we play pickleball in here, right? Like, yeah, maybe, but... So from a, and, and I mean, if you think about it too, from, from a physical ministry standpoint, like this building is our single greatest asset. How do we use this to reach people with the gospel, right? Groups ministry. We have some great groups, men's groups, women's groups, Wednesday night Bible studies, some good leaders in those respective groups. We don't have that one person to sit above it and go, here's the strategy for our groups. Here's how it all fits together to give vision and direction as a whole. Those ministries are thriving individually, but where do we take them as kind of the big picture? Right? Children's ministry needs to expand. We had a little bit of a smaller group up here this morning. There's normally about double those kids. 
we need to break up. The way people show up to Gallup Hill, and this has been the way it's been really the whole time, is you get two parents and like five kids, right? <laughs> or either when they get here, they come with like one kid, but then they drink the water, and then they have five kids, right? So if you just showed up, yeah, bottled water, people, bottled water. Uh, bottled water. Uh, but what it does, it, it, it's, it's an amazing thing. But right now, we need, to, we, we need our children's ministry to split. We need more classrooms. Uh, you know, we need, we need more volunteers, right, that can come in and help nurture these little kids. Right? And you being able to see, like, all the different stuff that's going on. Understand how all the different ministries kind of work together. But we use all of those, how? To worship, to nurture Christians, and to witness to the world. So listen, this is who we are, Right? Uh, we are a Baptist church, Southern Baptist church, located in the Protestant wing of the Western church, born out of the Reformation and the Catholic church, right, tracing that all the way back. We are defined by our commitment to Scripture. We baptize those who follow Jesus. We have uh, congregational governance, and we are elder-led. We have elders, deacons, ministry leaders to accomplish that mission. We are growing. We are expanding, right? And for the next 10 years of ministry, we're trying to figure out, like, how do we get ourselves set to continue to do this ministry that God has given us to do for the next 10 years. That's the process we're going through now. So the challenge for you, right, as we are on mission, is how do the gifts that God has given you fit into what this church that he's called you to is doing? I'm going to leave you with that thought. I'm going to pray for us, invite the worship team to come back up, and we'll continue to worship.